Cool. Okay, so um, this is my talk, 20 Drupal modules in 20 minutes. I was going to try and give a talk about Druxt and Decoupled, but I have kids and a very busy job, and I got sick, so I, do, I went with this. So what are the modules I'm going to showcase? I decided to just do a little bit of a talk where I broke it down and looked at some stuff that if you're ever using a Drupal project, you're probably going to be using these core things. So they're not in core, obviously, but they're not far off it some kind of more powerful things that you may or may not use when you're extending your Drupal project, some other kind of powerful things that you might be aware of, you may not be aware of, and some other things that you probably may not be aware of. Who knows? Only time will tell, and you can take it or leave it. So, But before I get started, um, one really kind of interesting thing is I was listening to a podcast with Angie Byron, who was at Arquia as like... Um, one of the original contributors and developer advocate who's now at Mongo, but still heavily involved in the Drupal core. And she was talking about how um, that we don't really recommend Drupal for people who are just doing small hobby sites. And it's true, like I have family and I don't want to do all the security updates on their behalf. So I'm like, use WordPress. And it's true, but like, you know, like I would never use WordPress for a really, really big site, like the sites I often work on. And, and I was thinking one of the reasons is like they brought up the security updates, which is really important. And it is super cool that the Drupal community is actually really across it rather than a lot of other open source projects that just kind of languish in the sun. But like one of the other things is I was thinking, like, when's the last time you tried to do a Drupal build without using Composer or without using even Drush? So I thought I'm going to give that a go. So I built this site locally. Um, here it is, uh, Meetup Test, which is what I'm going to be showcasing. And I also attempted to do it uh, by deploying a light sail Drupal 9 and tried to build this site without using Drush or without using Composer. And it was really painful. <laughs> like It took me less than 10 minutes to install about 16 modules. Um, and I'll go into the reason that not all of them are there with Composer and all the dependencies. But I. If you're, I don't know if anyone remembers this back from the old Drupal 6 and days or whatever, but you used to be able to, like, via the UI, add the FTP link and then continue it and then use the kind of update links that would run the update scripts and all of that. So I actually did it that way. And the site is effectively broken. Like, it doesn't save because it was allowing me to include stuff um, there we go, developer Steve. Yeah, <laughs> but it allowed, it actually allowed me to upload stuff that wasn't Drupal nine compatible. So <laughs> as a result, it doesn't work. So anyway, I'm going to try and showcase some of it on my um, on my deployed Drupal site, but I'll do most of it on the um, on the composer. Anyway, I'm wasting way too many of my twenty minutes. So let's look at some of the borderline core modules that you're probably going to install when you're running a Drupal site. Token. So um, with token, um, that effectively allows you to grab bits and pieces from your node. And um, oh, that's path auto. Whoops. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to use it in the example of path auto. So say I'm going to make a content. So any of my um, articles, I'm going to have a path pattern and say uh, blog. And then I can actually grab a token. Um, I'm sure a lot of you, just about everyone on this call will know this. but it's a really nice, powerful module that allows me to build all kinds of dynamic chains across the Drupal site by grabbing fields, by grabbing uh, components of areas, and making a nice thing. Path auto, I just demoed that there, really. And that allows you to make patterns for content types and taxonomy. So it means that I can, um, if I've got a taxonomy, I can include the title of that taxonomy in it. So if I'm linking to different tags, I could put in types of tags there. It, it gets you away from having node one, two, three. Again, I'm starting basic. Meta tag. This is another one that you that um, I feel like you probably would install most of the time. So meta tag actually, it's really cool. I think um, allows you to kind of well, who made these links? <laughs> I've got zero people I can blame about that. Anyway. Uh, meta tag kind of uh, allows you to, depending on the types of pages, you know, the, the content areas, um, the global settings, uh, set 
the kind of metadata that's at the top. And uh, for social sharing, really allow you to um, say, I've just enabled the Twitter card ones, um, make a summary card, grab an image, like a feature image from a content type, put it in, into it, link it up to the uh, Twitter account. And just means that if you've got your social sharing, it just kind of, it, it'll build the uh, Twitter cards that share your page in ways that you kind of want to see it done. So meta tags really useful for um, a metadata as well in the headers. And um, if you do go into the extend area of it, you'll see there's like 10 million variants on most of them you don't need, like Google Plus, what are you doing? Um, and really Twitter cards, if, if you want to just set one of them, the Twitter cards gets picked up by a lot of the others and works pretty well. Next one in my board line, and look, you don't have to use Lendo, but it seems to be what is the kind of default in the community. And um, it's effectively an abstraction of Docker Compose that allows you to run your site locally. So um, it's, you know, a while ago, we were all using virtual machines a long time ago. Um, and But Lendo seems to be the one that everyone's really using. Um, but Arquia now has, now that they've decommissioned, um, forgotten the cloud. The Dev desktop. Panel. Thank you. Um, now they've decommissioned that, they're moving towards our, uh, Lando as the uh, basic. And if you've got uh, Pantheon or Platform SH, they've got really cool recipes where you just kind of pull down uh, an environment from Pantheon or and then build it up and push it back up. So, and assuming our is going down the same route. So um, if you're developing locally and you're not using MAMP or WAMP, get into Lando, you won't regret it. Next one's to tweak, tweak. Um, and effectively, uh, I don't, I didn't actually do any coding for this. I just kind of built a site up, including the this horrendous way that I uh, did the kind of up manual uploading or whatever. But tweak, tweak is like a way that just gives you um, much better ways of doing your theming, um, and that's a lot more. Um, that's what I'm looking for. Less verbose. So if you're making a view, you can just kind of reference the, na the machine name of the view and the block. And then in your theme, you can just kind of drop in these, drop in these um, sequences. So Twig Tweak is a nice way to kind of, uh, it's also really good for accessing media um, from image or from Drupal image or from the media area, replacing tokens. Um, it just makes doing your theming a lot faster. Okay, so that, that's the basics. I mean, just about every site, even if I'm running locally, will have that. What are some of the more powerful things that we've got? Web form. So pretty much to me, I don't actually, all of my Drupal sites I'm running, I'm not using web form right now, but I do a lot in the past and it's one, and I sponsor collective, the uh, open collective for web form because I think it's that important. Um, it's an enterprise level form builder. It has so many millions of extensions that, um, now, now we're actually paying Jacob to maintain, which is fantastic. Um, it's also moving out there with cards and being able to be embedded by other um, parties so that you can actually literally put your forms into other places. It's super powerful and it's super easy to actually build a form. It's really quite, I remember, I think I gave a YAML forms talk way back when I first moved to Brisbane back in 2016 or whatever. And it's kind of built on that basis, but it just has a lot going in on. I've got to actually say, what's going on? Ah, it doesn't matter. I'll go straight to the build. Hey, look at that. Yeah, so during my talk developer, Steve, I was looking at all my extensions to make sure, holy crap, do I have any of those terrible ones he just described? I did not. Sorry, so look, oh, I'm getting to demo Lando. So here I'm just Lando start. It's now spinning up my containers and I should have a an address to get going. Anyway, I'll get back to Webform in a second. Search API is another really useful way that you can connect your uh, Drupal site to a search engine of some description. The one that it ships with and that you normally configure might be Apache Solar. And um, you know, if you're using Pantheon or one of those other guys, you might even have a container of a solar right there. And obviously search is annoying. So if you can streamline it, make it a lot easier, that's fantastic. And by default, you can do a table search and you get like um, 
Here we go. I don't, I was just ran, ra, ra, going on about how great Lando is. And while I'm talking about it, my freaking container stopped spinning. So let's go back into here. So like looking at web form, just the amazing amount of fields that are available to you and really does take security seriously as well. And does a lot. Lettuce web form, report an unsafe product. Okay, whoops. I'll, I I can't really see that on my phone, so I'll have to take Jana's, Jana's um, word on that. Uh, Search API is another one that you can, uh, and uh, here we go here, um, allows you to build, set up your own uh, servers and contact indexes and really go to a lot of kind of power and how you set that up quite easily from the UI. So, you know, just saying, oh, I only want to be able to, look at these particular bundles and I want to look at uh, excluding certain stop words, um, looking at the hierarchy, how you actually process it. So being able to boost words that are found in particular ways. So, you know, configuring a search engine is a lot of fun. So search API is a really nice way to get over the top of that. Paragraphs. Paragraphs, um, to be honest, I haven't used it a whole lot, but I know it's uh, pretty popular with site builders. Um, and rather than just kind of allowing users to chuck everything into a big um, WYSIWYG, it just allows you to kind of pre predefine some uh, different types of field sets that are repeatable. So let's go test one. And you can just therefore build kind of like a, a content type and put its own theming around it and use it in teasers and all that kind of jazz. Again, I'm doing 20 modules in 20 minutes, so it's rapid fast. So if you have, you put, uh, again, I'm in the basics. You've probably heard of this stuff if you haven't. Um, yeah, oh, maybe we can talk later or something. Display suite. So I was definitely in the Drupal seven days using this a lot. Um, and with display suite, it's just kind of a way of giving your site builders a lot more power over the display of their pages. So let's, um, let's use it. Um, so we'll go look at an article and we can look at the display, um, and then you've got from display suite a whole bunch of different layouts that come out of the box. Um, probably wouldn't use any of them because you want to rely on your theme somewhat. But you can then just kind of reset a um, a uh, theme, and then be able to use um, some different templates. So I can say, oh, "Expert, I want to put a prefix in front of that." wrap the label in some HTML elements and the feed elements. So if you needed to say build a tabular layout, um, but not have it really hard baked into the theme and still be able to use it there, it's quite useful. Um, also display suite um, allows you to also build these themes that become fields that become available in your layout. So you might add a token field. So if you remember back to token that inserts like a, a block of stuff inside the middle of your page or you might just insert a block field that becomes reusable. So it can be quite useful. Um, better, better to use the theme if you can. Uh, Ent Entity Browser is something that just kind of improves the authoring a, a little bit so that rather than you needing to constantly re-upload images, I mean, this is media now has its own uh, media browser, which uh, this was an absolute essential in Drupal 7, but has some useful extensions like drop zone JS, JS for uploading lots of media while you're doing your content authoring. But an example here would be let's 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 do an entity browser test here. Um, I think I've got an image here. Uh, let's have a look. So select entities can re-reference some of the stuff that I've already put up there. So kind of I'll select that entity. Oh, that's not an image. I should really filter that out. So I'll select that one instead. Maximum dimensions, yeah. So you can tell I've done no configuration because I really built most of this. this, this, um, this uh, yes, last night actually while I was getting over my cold. Okay, so here's some other powerful ones that are a little less well known. Now, I bang on a lot about Tome because I think it's really cool. Let's see if I've enabled it. So Tome actually takes a static scrape of your site 
So unlike, say, a site crawler of some description, it was built and, well, until recently maintained by Sam Mortison, who was in the Drupal security team, and he really knew it well. So it means that if you're not actively maintaining your Drupal site or it doesn't do a lot of interactions, you can just put in a URL, submit it, and it'll go off and it'll scrape your menus, it will look at your taxonomies, it will understand all the Drupal entities and build a static site. You can then preview that site. Here it is here. Um, and this is completely a static entity that exists. So it's really quite useful, particularly if you um, don't have a lot of time to maintain the site or it doesn't change very much. You could just spin up your Drupal instance on your local site. It has a plugin for Netlify. Um, it stores the content as in Git if you want it to as well. So you could just spin up your site, do your edits, use Tome, push it out to your static hosting, which I think I've demoed in this before with an S3 extension. And really then you're kind of getting all of the cool stuff that Drupal does in terms of content management and building paths and using those other modules apart from obviously web form and stuff like that. And then being able to not worry about having an application that's vulnerable and really just having static HTML. Also comes with like a uh, JavaScript search called Luna, um, which is like solar, but less bright that can run locally and give you that last bit of dy dynamism that could be quite useful. EU cookie compliance. Um, look, this is just a nice way to uh, organize the acceptance of your cookies. Um, so that, let's have a look at this, so that, you know, um, for different types of users, you can consent by default, opt in. If something is not being able, if consent is not given, the JavaScript that you're gonna disable, how the cookies are handled, the information banner about how you collect it. So it just kind of streamlines that kind of really important GDPR stuff. Group is another module that kind of in Drupal 7 organic groups was all the rage in 2012, 13, 14. It was kind of like a way of setting up a kind of mini site. I think closest equivalent I can think of is like WordPress's BuddyPress where you would have uh, arbitrary collections of content and have controllers and moderators of it. So group works in a kind of similar way in that you can create groups that have granular permissions and then inside those groups, you can create different content nodes and give control over to those people. So group could be quite useful for subscriptions or having different segments of the site for a community group or something along those lines. Focal point. Focal point is for site builders um, who want to Upload an uh, image and then be able to highlight when you automatically apply an image style that crops the image, which parts of the image is maintained. So uh, I think I actually, this is like one of the areas I actually did one. See, look, this is how much work I put into it. Go more. A photo at the art gallery, very meta. And, you know, just set the focal point within that image. I know that's a little bit hard to see, so yeah, big. Um, you can actually set the focal point of the image so that's around her face so that if we were to do a thumbnail, it would put that in the middle of the crop of it. So when I set my media style, so I've got a thumbnail that's 100 by 100, it's going to main, it's going to crop around there rather than just in the centre. Because if I was to take like a little, a very kind of... Um, thin slice of that image and it went on the middle, it would cut her out and it would just be like this little central pole. So it's just a, a kind of nice tool that allows that when the media styles are applied for making the different derivatives of the image for reuse, that uh, the focal point is what um, is used. Charts. So charts is one for visualizing your data. Um, you have a choice of different JavaScript libraries that you can use. Um, I think I just, Shows billboard. I think it might have been the only one that I put in. Let's have a look. All right. So look, charts default. Ah, oh, sorry, wrong one. Haven't actually said it yet. So it allows you to choose. Yeah, I put billboard in. It allows you to choose a library um, and develop some charts into that, and then being able to create a view, which you can see up here. And then from that view, so you might take in a whole bunch of content. No point in me making one. A, I've only got a minute per module, and B, don't have enough content in here. But it kind of allows you to then, using views and these defaults, bring in that content and visualize it using these kind of libraries. And Charts comes with a whole bunch of different JavaScript libraries. 
Um, so it just allows you kind of site builders who don't want to or have the skills for doing or licenses for Tableau to just kind of build. Okay, so here's some stuff you may not know about. Um, recurring events. So this is one that's still in beta or alpha, I think. Yeah, I could just check rather than speculate. Um, let's have a look. It is in release candidate one. Okay. I think it relies on something that's not quite ready. But it's really quite useful. It was developed for the library sector. That's why I know about it. Um, and allows you to set recurring events. And they can be daily, hourly, weekly, or whatever, which is you know not that novel. But in the past, recurring events were done by just spinning up oodles of nodes. But this kind of leverages the, leverages the development of that in a much better sense in that it allows overrides but, and exceptions, but the exceptions are stored against the content entity. So it's not just like, oh, yeah, if I've got hourly events, I'm going to make eight nodes per day for 365 days and then exclude the nodes that have been generated. It literally keeps the management over your events and all the discrete instances of it in a much better way, and it comes with event registration and capacity limits that can surge up and down. It's very, very powerful, actually, um, and, you know, kind of allows you to set different times on long weekends and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I didn't get a chance to set it up because I got sick and just didn't. Okay, so now we're getting to some other things. So this is a tool called uh, Drutney. Uh, I don't know if I've never actually used it. I've only heard of it. But it's a Drupal audit tool, so you can it can be a standalone project, or you can have it as a um, as a dependency, and it allows you to run against a whole bunch of set policies, like um, uh, the Drupal file systems, uh, the templates that are being used, any of the plugins that you've got uh, running there, and later regularly run that and audit your site. So that could be quite useful for maintenance, uh, looking for re potential remediations, maintaining policies as part of your quality assurance or your CI build. So um, nothing to showcase there. And the next two are uh, GraphQL. Um, this is kind of where you're heading towards your, your decoupled components. Now, as it turns out, when I did this, um, one of the dependencies of GraphQL is JSON API views. Uh, which has a dependency in JSON API resources, which is not compatible with Drupal 9. So I wasn't able to get this working. However, when I was using my, uh, what do you call it? When I was using this version that I built via the FTP upload technique through all of its misery, the one thing it did do is it allowed me to install modules that it shouldn't. <laughs> so I was able to get it working there, although the site's pretty cooked. So I don't know if that's a good thing. Um, so it does allow you to kind of create some endpoints and be able to kind of define a schema like a GraphQL endpoint and uh, then expose that to other consumers. So, um, and the, but, you know, it's broken and on that version and there's a couple of dependencies that need to catch up. And Druxt was another one that if I get a chance to look into better, will be my next talk, it was almost going to be this one. And that's maintained, I think, believe, um, Deciphered um, down in Melbourne actually maintains this one. Um, and that's a bridge between Drupal and Nux.js. So it's kind of like if you want to have a Nux front end and Drupal in the back, this is, this is like a module that's kind of built really uh, around that. So I'll go into it a bit more. And number 20, um, yeah, I didn't quite get to 20. Um, so it's really 19 modules in however long I've been talking. Uh, but I was going to try and look at Visualize, but I couldn't quite get it working. <laughs> and I have been talking fast, and I am now done. <laughs>